So I want to start with a text, if you would. I'm going to start reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body that the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. I started like that because I thought of, as we look at this psalm grouping tonight, the idea of the fragileness of our lives. And when I was going through and putting these psalms together, like I said, we're looking at psalms, groupings, kind of general concepts. I'm not going into great depth of dividing them all up and providing every one of them. But just three, and then I have some verses that I kind of did a search on. Psalms, verses that just are really great. And I'm just going to read those. I think it's important because I, I think we all know what it's like to feel threatened, I think, <laughs> at a time when you were afraid. Now, the older I get, you know, I mean, it's, it's a little different. My fears are different. Um, and I thought of this actually <laughs> last night because I, I was out there in the desert, night riding my bicycle on a dirt trail by myself. I saw some four-wheelers on their vehicles, and, and I was thinking about how one time I was riding, and I saw this mountain lion dart across, and, you know, and, and I thought, and I, and I just stopped and turned off my lights, and I was just there all by myself, and I thought, I'm not afraid. There, there's just something that I really wasn't that afraid of. I mean, things that might catch me or something, but that type of fear, and I, so I, you know, I, I think about my lessons that I'm going to bring and think about, and I thought, you know, when I tell people that I'm out there by myself like that, and I'm mountain biking, and there's nobody out there, that it doesn't bother me, I, you know, people look at me like, you should be afraid, you know, there's something about, and maybe I should, you know, maybe I'm just being, you know, maybe I should. What's funny is I'm more afraid about when I go back to my car, because there's, there's people who show up and steal catalytic converters. So what, the only fear I really had was going back, riding with my lights on, and all of a sudden my car has had the catalytic converter ripped out from under it. Because, like I said, I could see these four-wheelers out there just, you know, tearing stuff up. And I was the only one out there. But I thought, what is it about the dark? Dark has that effect, doesn't it? When you walk in, you have this, this fear. We have this sensation. And so I went to my memories of when... When did I feel secure? What was it that, that caused me to have that feeling of secure that overwhelmed me when I was little? And, and the first memory that came to my mind was my grandfather when I was stuck hanging off the garage. And he had some lumber that was hanging on the top of the garage. And me and my friend, Bill, we got up there. Well, we weren't supposed to be there, by the way. We were told not to crawl, crawl on the roof. Don't ever tell a kid that, right? Don't do that. So we're hanging there, and we're crying out for help. And my grandfather, I thought he was like 12 feet tall, because he walked up, and he's just looking at me eyeball to eyeball, basically, and he said, let go. And I knew when I saw him approaching, we're okay, we're going to live. You know, I bet it was only four foot away off the, where we're from. But when you're little, it could have been 1,000 feet. So I'm hanging there, and when he walked up, he's just looking at me. And I'm hanging there and looking at him, and I felt... I felt, as I saw that monster of a man walking towards us, I, thought, oh, I felt so safe. And then he got to a point, he stopped and he looked at me, he said, let go. And he didn't, he didn't grab me. And I thought to myself, now wait, sequence is out of step here. You know, come on, Grandpa, you grab me, then I let go. So it's kind of a test of what? Faith. Was he really going to let me fall? I mean, he come all the way out there. Why didn't he just stay inside and just let me fall? But there was that doubt. And, and the, but, but I looked at him and I felt safe. And then when he approached, I was feeling safe. And then he put his hands out, and I'm like, oh, okay, here it comes. And then he stopped. And he said, let go. And I just looked at him like, and then I let go, and then I felt those hands grab my chest. And I, I, I tell you, I think they went all the way around me. I think those monster hands just, you know, were able to lap around me, and, and I felt that. 
and then him just gently letting me down. That was a great feeling of security and fright all wrapped in one, but I was safe. Another time was with my father driving a truck. He was a truck driver. We got up into the mountains, up in the Gila wilderness. I don't know what we were doing, some delivery, but it was a semi-truck, one of those big ones. We broke down, and it was winter, and so we're waiting for someone to come and help us, and we're, me and my brother fell asleep. My dad was asleep, and all of a sudden, we woke up, and he's gone, and it's dark. There's no power to the vehicle. It's cold, and we hear this thumping on the truck, this banging, and my dad's gone, and me and my brother looked at each other, and we're scared to death. We heard the door open up, and all of a sudden, the door slammed shut, and he popped in with a flashlight, and I remember looking at his face, and I felt so safe. I had that feeling that it's okay. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. And I think that's what I hope that we can reach in and realize that, okay, no matter where you're in life, there's something about us that we, we have a vulnerability. And ours is older Christians and stuff. Maybe the things that go bump in the night don't scare us. But there's a lot of things that we face, that we have to deal with, that are extremely troubling. And they do disturb us. And the psalmist, and especially when we look at some of those, that if you know the writers of who they are, really bring to light some of those aspects. And I think we need to learn from them to help us to learn to call out to God in the same way. So there's these three psalms we're going to look at, 61, 91, and 121. And then I'll read some that are just some psalm verses that I, that I put together for us to look at. So Psalm 61 is the first one we'll look at. Psalm 61. Now the idea around this, the theme has been given, if your Bible has a notation on it, it's to lead me to the rock. Now there's a lot of songs. We have one, you know, about the rock, standing on the rock and such, and we know and understand that. This also adds another aspect that we'll look, kind of talk about but let's go ahead and read Psalm 61. <clears throat> Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you. When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your heart forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So I will ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day to day. So as we live our life, one of the things that he talks about is asking God to listen to him hear our prayers. And that's interesting because it seems like these are men of God, all the psalmists, but that's something that just keeps coming up to me when I'm putting together these lessons and looking at these psalms. It's this idea of the psalmist crying out saying, hear my prayer, hear my prayer, hear my prayer, hear my prayer. Lord, hear my prayer. Lord, hear my prayer. As if even the most spiritual-minded people, you know, there's times where we just want to really know, Lord, hear my prayer. And it's challenging, isn't it, for us to think about that. This psalm is believed, you know, it, it, it's attributed as being to David as a time in his life, possibly during the, the rebellion of Absalom, his son, when his own son basically was going to, he tried to perform a coup and to overthrow him. And so David, he just, he leaves. He leaves Jerusalem. And there's many times we can apply that to his life where he looks at that. But the one thing the psalmist is guiding to is, listen to me, Father. Take me to a place. Now, he's talking about, honestly, a spiritual place. He's not going to transport him. I don't think the psalmist ever realized that God has taken somebody and just moved him into a safe place, a safe location. But this is the rock. This is a location where we can feel that safety and security again. And to me, that's where we have to come back. We have to come back to God. When we're feeling unsure and we're asking for prayers, it's to come back to Him and ask that. The idea of a strong tower is something that, well, we don't live in a city with walls anymore or forts. But apparently, 
you know, cities had walls around the city, but they also had a watchtower. And that tower was the most secure. Even if they were to breach the walls and to come in, the king and the VIPs, the important people could retreat to this one location. And so that watchtower, that strong tower, they called it, was the most secure of all. So I thought that was a little bit of a, a part of cultural that when we look at, you know, that he also talks about living with God, but also fulfilling his promises to him, to God. And he's asking as well that as he did rule, David, that he would rule wisely, fulfilling his vows and be there for God. And so I will ever sing your praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Let's go to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. He will command the angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Did you recognize anything in this psalm? You notice there's, this is where, when we talk about the inspiration of the psalms, we talk about you know, when Jesus talks about him coming to fulfill the law and the prophets, and that even the Psalms were showing prophecies, and that these of all in the Psalms, where the psalmist would sit down and pen this psalm. And by the way, remember, these are songs. So they would sing them, and that's one of the ways they would memorize. This is one. If you look in what he has to say here, when he says... I will, verse 15, really starts to become more pointed toward a prophecy being fulfilled of the Messiah, starting really in 14, because he holds fast to me in love. So what we have is a voice change. It's almost God talking and then describing somebody. I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. When we look at this psalm and talking about the idea of also, remember, Satan knew this one too. That was the thing I was going to bring up, backing up. In verse, let me see here, on your hands bear you up. Yeah, in verse 11, this is where Satan, talking about him even knowing the scripture, he tells Jesus, jump, right? Go ahead, jump off. It's okay. And then he quotes this, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So that's how important even the Psalms were when we talk about looking at Satan himself. Um, so let's go to Psalm 121.
This is another one that has a verse, very first verse. I think it's beautiful because I mean, we, we hear this. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day or the noon by night, the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all other evil, all the evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and you're coming in from this time forward forevermore. When we think about the protection that he's providing us, we forget about the idea that we are being protected. We're being provided for. A lot of times it's not until we are in danger and it's going to be spiritually away from God. There, we're, we're far more protected than what we realize, even as Christians. We go back to the destruction of Jerusalem. It still amazes me. Josephus was a Jewish historian that was actually present and during the destruction of Jerusalem. And he was there. He actually became the, the general who future emperor, Titus, um, he had become a captive, Josephus. He was a rebel himself. He had caused a part of the rebellion. He got captive, and, and during this invasion and destruction of Jerusalem, he ends up somehow be, becoming close to the uh, general Titus. And during this destruction, he documents all that happened. And one of the things that he writes, and it's the history of the Jews in antiquity, but he talks about the idea that none of the people that were in the city were Christians that died. Now, he wasn't a Christian. He had no reason to say anything to that effect. Now, I don't, and I don't know how he knows that, but why he even mentioned it was kind of interesting to me. When we look at all the times through history, if we were to go and to be able to just analyze, we would see where God's hand had been with the people. Now, it may not have been in the same condition in which those people wanted to exist, but they were being provided for. I'm sure that the children of Israel, while they were suffering, they did not realize that God was still with them. And so a lot of times, we actually, we miss the greatest things. And so Psalms 21, I think, is a wonderful one to remind us, no matter what is going on around us and what's happening to us. One, I, I, this idea of God slumbering and sleeping, I feel like that. I know you do too at times. There's times where we think, he must be somewhere else because it just seems like he's not with me at this moment in my life. But he's, he is with us. And the psalmist reminds us of that. So now I just have some verses, just in, individual verses that I had gone through and kind of searched and put together. And then the lesson's yours. Psalms 32, verse 7. Lord, you are my refuge. You protect me from all danger and surround me with the songs of liberation. Psalm 68, 20. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs, escapes from death. Psalm 91, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. In Psalms 25, 50, 50, uh, 20, and 21. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I trust you. Let integrity and righteousness preserve me, for I wait for you. Psalms 40, 11. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me. O Lord, let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. Psalms 3.3 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. 56.13 For you have delivered my soul from death. You have not kept my feet from falling. Yet, that I may walk before the God in the light of the living. So how far do we trust God in our protection? 
And a lot of times we do things to secure ourselves and, and, and we're, we do a pretty good job of that, of protecting ourselves in, in the physical world around us. We have all sorts of safety features built into devices today, our cars. Today you'll probably drive home and you'll put a seatbelt on. Where did you get that habit? You know, we'll do all these things. We'll lock our doors. We'll buy security cameras and things like this. We're actively involved in seeking protection so that we don't get harmed. But how are we doing with our, with our spiritual side of our life? Are we seeking as much? And the only place that we can really secure ourselves in the most important way spiritually is in God's Word. If you're here with us this morning or this afternoon, my clock stops afternoon. <laughs> If you're here with us this afternoon and you're online streaming with us, I hope that if there's something we can do in your relationship with him, that you'll take this moment to evaluate how you've been living with him. Are you needing to take some action? I hope that you'll use this song as an opportunity to change in a positive way. Establish a relationship with him or to strengthen it to continue on. So think about these things while we sing the invitation song. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the cold? He will bear you gently, gently to the fold. See him soul and open, I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting at the door? Oft he knocketh softly, <coughs> softly o'er and o'er. Hear him soul and open, I implore. Why keep Jesus pleading at the door? He would be your Savior ever, evermore. Love him soul and open, I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting, King at the door? Soon he'll cease his pleading, yes, forevermore. Come, poor soul, obey him, I implore. Please be seated. <clears throat> 